So hello everyone, hello Zephyr people. Uh, my name is Pavel Hibner, uh, I'm CEO and co-founder of Hardwareio. And today I will introduce uh, the Chester platform, which we have had already for a few years. And the platform is targeted for industrial IoT applications. In Hardwareio, in general, we create open embedded platforms and uh, Chester is like our flagship product. So let's get started. So Chester started actually, it started a few years back uh, when we got a request from customer to create NB IoT thermometer uh, for the forest to correlate and monitor the occurrence of the bark beetle. Uh, back then we became uh, partners with Vodafone and uh, one of the first uh, adopters uh, of NB IoT technology in the Czech Republic. And uh, yeah, on the picture you can see my son, uh, he's super excited with the drilling machine. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, what is more exciting is the circle, yellow circle, which is Chester we have installed together in the forest. And where we are today, uh, Chester is uh, like a general multipurpose IoT platform uh, that is used by partners all around the world. And uh, this talk uh, is targeting anybody who is enthusiastic about uh, connected uh, hardware, uh, about firmware engineers, and uh, there will be a demo. So anybody who wants to see things in action. So, a little bit about uh, Chester. Uh, we usually represent it as uh, IoT hardware endpoint. Uh, you can see here in the picture that uh, it consists of uh, the yellow board, which is the main board. Uh, it is a low power platform, so it can be powered from batteries for years, a bit more about it later. And it is very extensible and uh, we usually pack it in a rugged IP67 enclosure. And our target customers, uh, they are partners. Uh, we are targeting B2B and uh, we provide full uh, sort of customization for that, UV uh, label printing and so on. And in the end, the process is like if you are creating or specifying your own car, you tell us uh, what kind of features you need, what kind of interfaces, and uh, we make it uh, tailored for your application. So the main board features, because this is the core, uh, and it's just not about this board, we have lots of extensions, but let's fly through it. Uh, there is a dynamic antenna system. There are two RF switches uh, over here and here, which are multiplexing uh, the LoRaWAN versus uh, cellular modem, and another RF switch, uh, which is uh, multiplexing between internal and external antenna. Uh, there is the cellular module on its own. We use Nordic NRF 9160. Uh, there is a lot of one module from Murata. Uh, we use some super caps on the board. That is because uh, usually here in the middle we can have the battery holder and the super caps are helping uh, to uh, survive the current spikes uh, required for LTE. Uh, there is of course another SIM card holder, the three-core LED, I2C terminal block, the the terminal blocks, there are two of them mapped uh, to the extension modules, I'll speak about it later. And uh, there is a hardware one wire bus master port and uh, on board I2C digital thermometer, the Bluetooth module, which is the main one, uh, we use again Nordic and RF52840. This one is hosting uh, Chester SDK and uh, this is what our customers are using to create uh, and craft their applications and eight megabyte of NOR flash. Uh, recently we made it work that we can flash uh, the main application firmware from external SPI flash. The U-Blox uh, GNSS module uh, supporting GPS, GLONASS, Galileo, and Beidou, uh, the push button, and uh, again, I2C I peripheral, the three axis uh, MEMS accelerometer. So uh, that, that was the main board uh, flyover. Uh, the main pillar of this platform is, of course, the connectivity. So uh, for short range, we have Bluetooth that you can use for diagnostics, for reconfiguration, for firmware upgrades. Uh, I mentioned Seller, so we support NB IoT and CAT-M. And uh, for 868 MHz or 915 for the US, we've got a uh, lot of our module. And uh, recently we added uh, to the family of Chester ecosystem uh, the satellite connectivity through uh, Ast AstroCast technology. Uh, that one communicates in L-band, uh, and uh, it's amazing because we have a few uh, customers in agricultural business, so uh, Chester platform can now communicate from anywhere in the world. 
and I've already spoken about this uh, GNSS connectivity supporting those four standards. Uh, you can see that there's a lot, lot of radios on the board, uh, but of course, uh, in order to optimize the cost, we uh, provide several main board variants. So yes, we have a fully fledged one, but then we, uh, uh, we shrink it down to whatever the customers need. Uh, the second very important pillar is hardware extensibility. Uh, I have put a few pictures of the modules, but trust, trust me, we have uh, far more. We have like almost 20 modules now in the family. We have like three types. Uh, we call them uh, the backside modules. Those are the guys, uh, uh, red guys on the right. Uh, and uh, they define actually the functionality of the terminal blocks. If you remember, there were like two uh, big terminal blocks. You can use two of these uh, backside modules as the extension and we provide interfaces like RS485, uh, precision uh, analog inputs, all kinds of DCDC converters, and we are usually adding the new additions to the family based on the application requirements. So uh, these are the back size. then we have top cover modules. I've mentioned the satellite, it's one of the examples, uh, but we also have uh, recently added this uh, display module, uh, Chester D1, uh, which uh, offers the low power LCD with capacitive touch uh, touch buttons, and uh, many others. And the last but not least, uh, usually uh, if the out of the box uh, connectivity and mechanical constraints for this uh, 130 by 180 millimeters enclosure is not sufficient, we are creating these uh, green carrier boards with multiple interfaces, pluggable terminal blocks, and so on. So still, the base is clear, it's just the main board. Uh, which is certified and which makes the whole ecosystem extremely versatile. The third pillar is low power flexibility. Uh, we uh, use 7.7 uh, amp hour lithium thionyl chloride batteries, uh, which can uh, energize your application. Let's say we have a cellular application which sends data every half an hour. Uh, the typical question current is like 230 microamps, including Bluetooth beaconing. Uh, this doesn't uh, seem to be like the lowest uh, ultra low power number, but we have to also take into consideration there is overhead on the supercaps, the leakage, uh, some DC DC converter, uh, idle current, and so on. But altogether, uh, including, uh, including uh, NBIoT idle modes, it's like uh, 230, and that will provide you with this uh, battery of like three years of battery lifespan. And uh, there is flexibility. So, um, we have uh, hardware logic, uh, which can prioritize if you have like multiple uh, available power sources, whichever goes first. Of course, uh, the, the battery uh, sources are deprioritized. So anytime you uh, connect uh, solar photovoltaic cells or ACDC converter, whatever, uh, it's, it's just uh, used in the first place. So uh, also we have rechargeable uh, module, we call it Chester Z, uh, which is like one of the top cover modules. And uh, that one provides like wide uh, operating uh, range and you can connect solar panels to it. It will charge the lithium ion battery and uh, you can therefore use it in the field uh, in the night and day uh, shift mode. So uh, it has very low maintenance. Uh, However, if you go with primary battery and one is not enough, we also have solution. So uh, we, we use carry boards to just connect multiple of these like in parallel, of course using shotkey diodes to prevent any overcharging of the primary cells because that's the danger zone. And uh, for example, uh, this uh, enclosure I have here on the slide, uh, that one provides 112 amp hours. Uh, so we have a customer who actually asked that uh, they want to send data, I don't know, every three minutes. I don't remember exa exactly, but they needed uh, like five years of battery lifetime. So yeah, this was the answer. Uh, each of those cells, in this case, they have 17 amp, amp hours. Uh, we have lots of uh, real applications. We have been uh, deploying this uh, platform for, for a few years. Uh, this is like a famous uh, application. Uh, this, this, this man in the forest became quite... Uh, famous on the internet uh, because we use it everywhere. And uh, we cooperate with Vodafone in the UK. We monitor uh, the environmental and impact of uh, climate changes on the tree growth. So the strip you can see around uh, the, uh, this uh, trunk of the tree, it's called uh, dendrometer. And uh, it provides proportional voltage as the trees are growing and uh, scientists, 
scientists are using all kinds of uh, data that we are gathering, like soil uh, moisture, temperature, environmental conditions, to correlate like how, how this affects the tree growth. Uh, this is my favorite because uh, we have a few partners that literally establish their business around Chester Platform. Uh, we have a company called StatoTest, uh, and they are using uh, Chester Platform to, to monitor the inclination of bridges in very long term, and therefore they, they are sort of providing uh, the predictive maintenance for bridges, and they have built all uh, ecosystem like uh, backends, frontends, and of course uh, notification systems, and uh, they basically reshape the product that is their own. Again, Chester is a platform to help the partners to build their own products. Uh, also, another partner, Adastra, uh, Chester works well in the retail for digitization, so we gather the data, real-time data from these so-called smart shelves uh, and cooperate with some famous breweries uh, to like monitor exactly how, how, the, how the cans or the beers are taken, which one are prioritized by the customers, and uh, Chester monitors like 1,000 pixels uh, in the shelf. Uh, and reports uh, those data uh, to the cloud or platform where our partner Arastra creates uh, their logic on top of it. Uh, utility segment, uh, this uh, picture on the left, uh, it's called cathodic protection monitoring. If you are distributing gas, uh, you have to somehow protect uh, these, uh, uh, these gas pipes uh, against corrosion. And they do it the way that there are like negative voltage generators and uh, these have to be uh, ensured that they are check that they generate that small like minus two volts negative voltage and uh, usually what they do they send technician in the field they measure the voltage by multimeter now and then they check it they write it maybe with uh, pen and paper and of course this is something uh, that can be improved so we are working with uh, one supplier uh, for this utility segment and to use Chester again to using galvanic isolation module to monitor this voltage that it works and uh, things like uh, cabinet uh, environmental monitoring uh, and, and similar. So, uh, in the world of IoT, uh, you will find lots of uh, overlaps. And uh, we discovered that Chester is often used for similar use cases. This is why we have brought this concept of what we call catalog applications. And we have like 10 of them today and it's growing. Uh, it uses the same ecosystem, the same Chester SDK running Zephyr. It's uh, using uh, this, this almost the same hardware foundation. And it's all, only about different application business logic implementation and different set of peripherals connected to it. I have an example here. Uh, this is called uh, Chester, Chester Push. Uh, we use it heavily in our production for, for the so-called undone system. So for example, if you want to uh, reduce the reaction time when something goes wrong in the production line. Uh, you can have uh, such such a device uh, that uh, will change the state. Uh, we can uh, label print some states uh, for the requirements of the customer, and they will immediately receive the notification and they can react to it. We have one, one installation in Chicago Auto where we have this these uh, bar LED strips in the hall, like uh, at the at the ceiling, and they immediately know which station. Uh, has some issue. Uh, that, that one was uh, using LoRaWAN. So uh, we have all kinds of applications for different purposes and we offer them like off the shelf and uh, their implementation is open. So anybody, any developer that starts uh, to create their own and something is similar, they can use this reference uh, application as the boilerplate and uh, start, from, start from there. We are coming up uh, with a new one, which is quite exciting because recently we have finished the implementation of the two-way communication and we are introducing the catalog application Chester Control, which will al allow uh, not just uh, uh, control of the relays, but also quite ad advanced parametrics uh, of the inputs and, and uh, defining some logic between the inputs and outputs. And uh, yeah, this is what we are about to expand uh, next to the developer's offering of the Chester. We have these ready-made products which are also immediately available in the stock. So next, uh, of course, uh, it's about ecosystem. Yeah? Uh, we, we are like one, one puzzle, but of course we built our foundation on top of the others as well. Uh, we cooperate with Nordic, as I mentioned. It's our, it's our silicon vendor for Bluetooth and cellular. And uh, they create their NRF Connect SDK, which is the core foundation for Chester SDK. Uh, and they inherit, of course, Zephyr, uh, which is, I would say, the best operating system ever for microcontrollers. 
and uh, we also have some technological partners uh, such as Battery Check, which is a Slovakian company, they are a startup, and uh, they are doing advanced uh, battery analytics and using neural networks to analyze the state of the lithium battery, their state of health, and uh, they can, again, provide some predictive maintenance. Uh, uh, they are now deploying systems which are related to safety critical applications uh, for systems that are like uh, sort of uh, helping and preventing uh, in fire uh, emergency situations. And uh, battery check is using uh, Chester to like observe the current from the battery, temperature, voltage, and other conditions. And uh, there is Sternum, uh, which is our new technological partners. Sternum is an Israeli startup which uh, sort of provides a very comprehensive so software stack uh, on a cloud and also for, as an like, agent for the microcontroller and tooling, uh, which helps to basically uh, adjust your application so and prevent uh, cyber security threats before they happen. It's uh, very advanced. They also provide uh, uh, traces, uh, logging, and uh, the core idea is to make your devices in the field as robust and secure and safe as possible. Uh, our connection to Zephyr, and probably you, you know, so it's more targeted now for anybody coming new to the Zephyr ecosystem. Uh, Chester, uh, Chester, sorry, uh, Zephyr was uh, designed from the beginning uh, for IoT devices with low power in mind, uh, with security in mind, and um, uh, it integrates with vast ecosystem of uh, projects. And uh, we jumped on it uh, simply because uh, we already used an RF uh, or Nordic ecosystem before, and uh, Nordic has switched fully to Zephyr a few years back, and uh, we have followed, uh, and we really like it because uh, we realized that uh, this is like another step uh, another ecosystem that uh, encourages true portability uh, and reusability of your uh, software components that you implement. Of course, uh, there, is, uh, there is always some learning curve. It's uh, not uh, the easiest ecosystem to jump into, but it improves uh, qu quite a lot. Uh, there is an always uh, enhanced uh, documentation and more and more resources uh, are coming there, and there are more and more use cases. So there is way more inspiration than when we came to the ecosystem about three years ago. Uh, and despite it is still some leap to jump, I would say it is definitely worth, uh, and uh, it's a it's a good uh, protection of your investments in true code in the future. How Chester looks uh, from let's call it a firmware landscape. Uh, when you look at the board, uh, as an embedded programmer uh, engineer, you want to see like what are the core components that you care about. There are three. Uh, those uh, two right, uh, they are the modems, Solar and Murata, and they are connected with the application Bluetooth SOC uh, through UART. Uh, there is traditional AT command style. For Solar modem, we are using uh, reference implementation from Nordic called Serial LT modem, which uh, always gets improved. And on the board, you will find three uh, standard uh, nine-pin uh, debug connectors, and uh, Chester SDK runs on the on the Bluetooth Bluetooth part. Uh, the software stack, uh, it as you know, uh, the West workspace is composed of so many repositories. Luckily, uh, the West tool uh, makes the management of these uh, very easy, and this is the like onion-like structure, but of course uh, those folders are sitting next to each other. Uh, we start from Zephyr, and RF Connect SDK inherits that as a submodule. We inherit uh, an RF Connect SDK locked to some specific version, and you can go uh, uh, on and on. And uh, uh, another great thing uh, about Zephyr is uh, hardware abstraction. So. I always like to use this example. Maybe remember it when I talked about those carrier boards. Uh, sometimes uh, we need to move uh, this uh, LED uh, on the carrier board in a bigger enclosure to another spot. So this is where uh, device tree really helps to abstract uh, the hardware definition and uh, the implementation. And uh, transferring the LED uh, to a GPIO expander sitting somewhere else was as easy as changing uh, a few words. Uh, and applying the device tree overlay. Uh, we usually do it through the shield subsystem. And uh, I have changed just uh, a few a few letters and magic magic happened. Yeah. So this is why it's great. 
Modular Rete is another cool feature of Zephyr. It's uh, Zephyr, I would say it's like a framework, which is almost like enforcing that. Of course, you can always fight it back, but why would you? Uh, and uh, the, the goal is uh, to guide you and keep uh, true independence of the blocks and uh, avoid uh, cross-dependency. Uh, here on the right, you can see as the very uh, minimalistic snippet of kconfig that you can put in your application folder. Uh, you can introduce uh, a symbol, uh, state that it's a boolean, give it some default values, and maybe the, when the symbol is selected, enabled, it can imply like the selection of some other other symbols. And uh, then you need to, of course, if if, if you have uh, kconfig in your uh, application structure, you need to also instruct uh, the kconfig system that it should con uh, continue uh, with uh, Zephyr standard kconfig processing. And in your PRJ con file which defines like how those options are used. Uh, you can just uh, uh, use config underscore the symbol name and give it, uh, give it the selection. So um, that's one way, like how you can embrace modularity is to introduce uh, these uh, symbols and then use them later in uh, CMake lists and uh, apply the add subdirectory, which is standard uh, CMake command with underscore if that and reference that symbol. So this is the way like how you can uh, have lots of uh, modules in your project, in your subsystems, and still uh, keep it separate and minimalistic. The first philosophy is uh, going uh, always and being explicit. It starts from zero and you are adding new features, enabling new things on top of it. Uh, there is uh, another nice neat thing that you can use uh, Zephyr modules and it is like standard mechanism. You can add the modules folder in your application directory and the build system knows and you don't have to even alter the CMake file. You can keep things uh, stick together. You can just add kconfig CMake list and your module implementation and this will be automatically included in your project. Uh, next uh, is coherence. Uh, this is another great thing because uh, I was talking about avoiding cross dependencies uh, I talk about it here, like what is the cross-dependency if you have some, let's say, main.c and you are including lots of header files, every of those uh, modules have some init function and they are, we are calling one after the other. Uh, so Zephyr has mechanisms how it can save you from that. Of course, you will not uh, reach 100% uh, cross-dependency avoidance prob probably. It's like holy grail, on the other hand. Uh, you can you can uh, go with the submodules and uh, and uh, subsystems as uh, much as possible thanks to for example sys init mechanism. So if, if you have an init function, uh, you can implement it like you are normally used to. And now there is uh, there is this red circle. Does anybody know why I'm circling uh, the void parameters of the init function? Okay, uh, I'll tell you, uh, in the past, uh, this init function, it has to have uh, the pointer reference to a uh, device structure. Uh, this is like the same overlap if you are implementing a Zephyr driver, uh, the, the parameter had to be there. With the latest release, uh, 340, uh, they have made enhancement that because it didn't make sense uh, to uh, enforce the developers to use a reference uh, to devices. Uh, you can now avoid that because uh, it will also match there is like a uni, uni implementation and you can use uh, like this format uh, without this random parameter and uh, you can just use this macrosis in it uh, uh, give it the name of the function tell what is the zephyr boot stage what is the boot priority which is number 0 to 99 0 is the uh, highest priority 99 is the lowest and uh, that's it you just Included in the build, uh, and Zephyr uh, puts the reference to this func function uh, to a table, and uh, based on the priority, it will be automatically called for you. Great, you don't have to be explicit about calling in it. Uh, and of course, you can use uh, uh, the build time constraints, like build assert, to actually make sure that if you are referencing something in your init function, uh, that that particular module will be initialized before you. So usually the practice is that at the end, you insert build assert and you define the constraint yeah, that uh, the priority of your module is uh, lower than the other one you are referencing. Uh, also, we have, apart from init, other things that are really helping this uh, coherence, which is logging. Uh, you can see here on this line 
this log module register where you define the logger module name and what is the minimum level. So on each of those uh, modules in your application, you can define individual uh, log levels. Uh, there is also shell. Uh, maybe you have already worked with it. I will show it in a bit. Is that uh, you can create your own custom commands, and again, they can be coherent uh, to the given uh, uh, C file implementation. And settings. Uh, very often, you need to store some parameters, some data. So uh, Zephyr again is ready to keep it in the same place, related to the module, all uh, all together. So uh, let's do a bit of demo. Uh, I will switch uh, now to to the terminal. And uh, I will show here on my table. I've got uh, Chester mainboard. Uh, it's a special variant, the dev kit, because here from the bottom we have uh, the Spring terminals, and you can swap and replace those extension modules which are defining the functionality for the terminal box. And uh, I have connected uh, Segre Jailing uh, and uh, Power Profiler kit from Nordic. Uh, raise your hand. Who, who, who uses uh, Power Profiler kit? Is there anybody? Okay, one, two, three, yeah. Well, guys, if you are a middle-level person, this is like really an available tool. It costs like uh, $100 approximately. And uh, we will start from there uh, because uh, uh, the purpose of the Power Profiler Kit is to energize your application and you can also uh, use it to uh, trace uh, the power profile of your software. So when you connect to it, uh, using this Power Profiler GUI tool, which works for all the systems. You can set your target voltage. Now I'm making uh, the battery, so I have 3.6 volt. I can switch it off. I can start uh, like uh, tracing the Power Profile. When I switch it on, you see that something's going on in my application and it's powered. I can stop it, I can zoom it, I can analyze what is the average power consumption. And what we usually do when we uh, create some new implementation, we let it run for a few hours, including all the Neuroband, cellular, LoRaWAN, whatever transmissions, and we calculate uh, the average current uh, over the long course of time, and therefore, uh, by simple uh, division, we can estimate by capacity of the battery what would be the uh, approximate typical lifetime of the given implementation. So that's the Power Profiler Kit. Uh, we actually distribute it as part of the Chester Development Kit, including the J-Link. And now, uh, let's build uh, an application, we, we will not build it, like compile it, but we will, we will flash something we have prepared. Let's uh, prepare an application that is uh, transmitting uh, one wire uh, thermometer temperature and uh, sends, sends it over cellular, over NB-IoT network of Vodafone here in the Czech Republic, and uh, we will see it, see the data in the cloud. Now, I have moved my cable, so it probably is connected. It will still work. So I have to reconnect PPK. to the program now. So let's start it again. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's flash the firmware. Uh, the J-Link is connected. And uh, it's not just about uh, hardware in hardware. We invest a lot into tooling and we have created uh, the PyPay uh, package, Python package called hardware. It has many modules. So one of them is Chester. And it, it allows you to uh, do all kinds of things like flashing firm firmware, uploading firmware to hardware cloud, uh, opening console. And now I'm flashing firmware with this uh, weird, uh, uh, weird uh, set of hex characters uh, that is actually like the secret uh, that, that is generated for you in hardware cloud when you upload the built artifacts. And uh, this is something that uh, for catalog applications uh, you can find in our documentation. So we have docs.hardware.com, uh, and if you go to Chester section and catalog applications and scroll down a little bit, we have uh, the overview of the catalog sets, and then there is uh, the list of firmware variants uh, that are there for these uh, applications. So uh, there is a version, there is this identifier that I'm using right now in the, in the shell, and uh, I'll just trigger, trigger the command, um, low voltage, Maybe it's again not connected. Yeah, maybe the target, maybe the cable between PPK. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that was it. Uh, so let's go back and try to flush it again. So.
So now it's erasing the flash. Uh, of course, if the firmware is not downloaded locally in my uh, in my cache, uh, it will it will download it, and uh, later it doesn't have to. Now it's flushing uh, the memory, and uh, after verification, we will start uh, another subcommand of this uh, hardware package, which, which is called console. So when I start it. I will see uh, this uh, two-panel uh, uh, terminal-friendly uh, app, uh, which uh, on the right side provides the device locks. Uh, we have uh, color differentiation for all kinds of lock levels. Uh, there is uh, four in Zephyr. It's info, warning, uh, debug, and error. And on the right side, I've got this uh, interactive shell. So I can use uh, standard uh, Zephyr shell commands that are built in there. Uh, but also we have introduced a few. Uh, from standard uh, Zephyr commands, you can, for example, ask uh, the kernel for uptime, uh, or you can do things like kernel reboot called and reboot the application. So on the right, start, uh, right side, you will see it starts from the beginning. And uh, you can easily introduce your own. Uh, so for example, in our Chester SDK, we have this config command. So let's check what it offers. Uh, so config allows you to, for example, show the current configuration of uh, your project. And in command line style, it dumps uh, all the parameters that are there. You can copy paste it, you can share it, and somebody, somebody somewhere else with the same set of commands can replicate uh, the same settings for the given firmware build. Uh, you can also change it. Uh, however, if you are changing now the, the, these parameters, nothing is actually applied until you use config save, which is like a commit. It will write all the parameters to flash, and it will start fresh. So you don't have to manage or implement the change management. For this IoT application, you rarely change their uh, configuration. So let's keep things si simple. Uh, just it's more important to have things atomic. So you keep changing them, the parameters as much as you like once you are already config safe, and it will reboot. Alternatively, you can do config reset which will uh, trigger the factory default reset. Okay, there is another command, which is called info. Uh, it provides uh, this uh, command info show. Sorry, info show. And uh, here you can see uh, the vendor information, uh, like a serial number, the claim token for registration to the cloud, Bluetooth address, uh, what is the uh, hardware variant, hardware revision, and so on. And uh, on the right side, you can see already something's going on in the application. Uh, actually, the message was just sent. And we will, we will use that uh, serial number uh, 7984 uh, to find it in Hardware Cloud and see the messages from it. So let's switch uh, to the browser and open Hardware Cloud. This is the left one. Is it? Yeah, this one looks like it's the button application. Yep. So yeah, this is 984. So a few words about Hardware Cloud. It's like our uh, SaaS, uh, which is optional. Uh, we don't enforce anybody using it, but it's so much easier for our partners, for integrators, to jump into it and focus on uh, the added value of the data on the JSONs. It's not application platform today, so we don't do dashboards, uh, widgets, nothing like that. But uh, the main purpose is to actually integrate and allow access through REST API, or you can configure webhooks to uh, immediately push the data as soon as they arrive from the devices uh, to your own services. And uh, I can see that uh, there is a message, uh, uh, 1155, I assume we have to refresh it. Yeah, and there is 1243. We can see and explore the JSON structure. And uh, you will see some envelope that is quite common for all those applications, which are adding some diagnostic information. You can see some uh, same stuff I just shown in a, in a console from info, info section. You can see uptime, you can see network parameters, the email number of the modem, MC number of the same MC, some network parameters, some onboard data, thermometer, accelerometer, and the useful data that you care about. There is this. Uh, one by thermometer, and you can see the measurements uh, which come as array with timestamp and aggregated values of minimum, maximum, average, and median. So you can process it and push it to your time series database. And below JSON, you will see the raw data. Uh, from this raw data, we have processed this JSON. 
of course, we are talking about low power devices with optimization uh, over NBOT and, uh, and UDP and stuff like that. So uh, we don't transfer JSON, we transfer CBOR and we upload the so-called codec uh, where we have like uh, a binding between the integers and the dictionaries and also some uh, metadata like how shall we process the values that are coming after the keys like division, multiplication, uh, whether there is enum and so on. And this way, we don't have to alter our uh, backend uh, processing pipeline. We can have it generic, and device can push any arbitrary structure. And if it uploads the codec, uh, the hardware cloud can render the J JSON in any way uh, the developer desires. So, this is hardware cloud, uh, and uh, I think uh, that's uh, the main part of the of the demo. I should have also mentioned that uh, we've got a Bluetooth application, hardware manager, uh, that is available for iOS and uh, Google uh, uh, Google Play, and uh, that one allows you to flash firmware to the units or open the console that I'm just showing you on the left side, this interactive shell, and do it uh, through Bluetooth. Uh, we don't have enough time to show all the all the tooling that we have. Uh, it's just to mention that uh, that is uh, this is the part uh, of the ecosystem. Okay, uh, let's jump back. Uh, so, uh, we are uh, trying to be also active, uh, proactive in, in uh, Zephyr development and NRF Connect SDK. We have done ourselves a few contributions. Uh, I would like to also raise the special credits to uh, Tomas Strenger and Kaspar Frederick who have contributed a lot to OneWire ecosystem. Uh, we were pushing this uh, quite a bit, uh, and uh, we have lots of applications in the field now using this one wire. It is uh, it is well tested. It is uh, fairly new. It's been around for about a year, March in the main, and I encourage you to to test it. Uh, and Casper uh, has also made uh, drivers for the hardware one wire bus masters. Uh, we have one in implemented on the Chester mainboard. And that is uh, like a bridge from I square C to one wire. The advantage for hardware one wire uh, uh, bus masters is that you have the so-called active pull up. So you can reach uh, much, uh, much longer distances, communication distances than if you do just uh, GPIO toggling. I know that one is, uh, let's say more cost effective, but uh, it is, I would say a trade off, trade off for many aspects. Uh, in the future, uh, because we use a lot of shields, you have seen that we have many uh, catalog applications. Each of the catalog applications, it's using some variants, depends what you connect to it. So uh, we are using shields. Uh, it's a well-established ecosystem in Zephyr, but uh, it has some limitations. And recently, uh, Zephyr introduced the so-called snippets, which is, I would say, a good replacement for the shields. It gives you a bit more flexibility and you can do like PRG conf uh, overlays. Whereas with the shields, you have to uh, like deal only with uh, kconfig files and that has some, I'll say, uh, limitations because as we know, uh, kconfig is uh, one pass through and uh, it, you can, it can get you to situations where you will have to explore what is the ultimately uh, the output of the kconfig uh, if things don't get enabled as you, as you requested. Also, uh, we really like uh, the, the addition of Zbus. Uh, Zbus is a very interesting subsystem to Zephyr because it allows you to do pop sub messaging. And again, it will allow you to decouple the components even, even better. So uh, we are about to start testing this and implementing uh, to uh, some of our subsystems. Uh, Chester SDK uh, from uh, this Sunday, uh, I mean last, but what happened is open source. It's on GitHub. Uh, there is uh, this uh, Chester SDK repository with a few hundred uh, commits, and uh, we are actively working on it, enhancing it, and uh, now it is available to everybody uh, under a hardware of five clause license, which is very permissive. You can share it, modify, distribute it, uh, but of course, uh, like Nordic does it uh, under the conditions that you use it with hardware-related products. Uh, but uh, it can be a great source of inspiration because uh, we are using uh, some, uh, some uh, corners of Zephyr which are only in the documentation and you don't find like uh, app, app, uh, examples, references to it anywhere else. So we hope that this will help also to, to others on how to use various things in Zephyr. 
so uh, everybody uh, can start with the Chester dev kit. Uh, it's got Segre Jailing, uh, this uh, special main board uh, version for developers. Uh, a few, a few extension modules that are attached to it using magnets, uh, like uh, DCDC converter, uh, RS485 uh, extension module, and uh, the configurable for channel analog digital uh, input module. Also, there is this power profiler kit, and uh, this is like, I would say, for any integrator, uh, the great starting point. Of course, uh, it doesn't have to be exactly the Chester dev kit. Uh, it can be any of our application, but uh, dev kit has advantage that it doesn't have super caps, because super caps, if you have it on the table, you want to do some power cycling and so on. It's, it's a burden, yeah. Uh, this is why uh, we have even on the latest revision implemented the white LED from the button that, that is activated by the push button. <laughs> that is uh, just to make your life in the field a little bit easier because it's quite annoying if you have to wait like 20 minutes when you, by commands, activate all LEDs from the, from the front side. You are waiting like 15 minutes before the LEDs discharge the super caps. Otherwise, you can wait for the whole day long. So this uh, power LED will discharge it within like 20 seconds. Um, yeah, so that's the difference. No super caps on DevKit version, uh, because also super caps uh, make it a little bit more difficult to tracing down like uh, what your power uh, uh, current profile is currently doing in the software, because it's filtering that out all the spikes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, thank you, thank you for your attention. Uh, uh, we have a boot uh, down there, uh, boot number 33. So you are welcome. Uh, to, to see us and discuss. Uh, we have a uh, few more gadgets uh, on the table. And uh, yeah, uh, are there any questions? Uh, please. Hello, well, I'd like to ask how, you, how do you perform the firmware update for the devices that are already in the field? Yes, uh, today we do it only through Bluetooth. Uh, but as I was talking about the two-way communication, that is like the first stage uh, before we do it uh, remotely. Uh, this is very desired features you can imagine from all our partners. And uh, we have, however, taken some steps. Uh, now we have uh, in, uh, in our Chester tree a sample which allows you to build firmware uh, with bootloader that allows for flashing from this uh, eight megabyte SPI North flash. So that's the first step. Uh, and uh, we will soon make a breaking change for all our catalog applications that they will essentially have to be refreshed using JLink to change the bootloader to support that. Uh, and there are multiple steps uh, to coordinate uh, to bring this. But technically, uh, it should, we shouldn't be that far from that goal because uh, as we already have REST API interfaces to push some data uh, from the cloud to the unit uh, and we support um, uh, bulk transfers, so it's basically a few, I would say, long, longer weeks before we deliver this fun functionality in Chester SDK. And my second question is, uh, you saw that some firmware that are stored in the cloud. How do you use them? Uh, oh, yes. Uh, okay, so I was talking about this hardware uh, Python tool. Uh, so I'll go to the console. Oh, no, I have just uh, swapped so the screens, so I'll try to get it back, mirror. Yeah. Martin, F10 doesn't work. Control F10, let's try it. No. Yeah, okay. Uh, so hardware, uh, and if we, if we look actually in the uh, Chester commands, uh, and uh, we explore the app section. Uh, there is another subsection called firmware. It's a little bit nested now, right? And that one allows you to upload uh, the artifacts. So when you finish the Zephyr build, uh, this command will actually look into your build folder and depends whether it's uh, built with the bootloader, so that is matched.hex and uh, up update.bin. It will like um, sanitize them, create the zip file, and uh, using this command, you are enforced to use hardware cloud API token. So if you provide this together, it will upload the artifacts and it will generate for you the, this, this uh, hexadecimal token. 
and uh, you will also receive email notification uh, with the build with this so-called Chester firmware page where you will also see the QR code and you can use that QR code with uh, a mobile application hardware manager to scan it and flush it. So it's like a uh, fileless uh, firmware management. And our partners are using that because it's simplifying the whole deployment the process so you can like deploy many times a day without hassle, sharing attachments, emails and so on. Yeah, thank you. I want to ask uh, how many devices you have in the field? Uh, whew, it's, uh, it's actually quite difficult to answer. It's, uh, I would say, between two and 3,000. Uh, I didn't count exactly because some of them are clear. clear. We have them uh, connected to hardware cloud and uh, they are uh, constantly uh, streaming some data. Some of them are uh, LoRaWAN devices. Uh, this is the second generation of Chester, so I'm talking about uh, this quantity. Uh, but also we had the previous one, which was not open source, and we also have uh, quite a bunch of them in the field. So uh, generally, I think Hardware Cloud uh, today is, uh, has registered like uh, four or five K of devices. So, any more questions? Sorry? Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, we are all, we're talking like 50 minutes. Uh, Jennifer, do we have time? Okay, good. So, yeah, thank you so much and enjoy the rest of the event. <laughs>